Good afternoon. My name is Beth Morrison, Senior Curator in the Department of Manuscripts. On behalf of our department, I would like to welcome you to today's program, Modern Games Medieval Wildframes. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land that the Getty inhabits today. It was once known as Tavangar, the home of the Gabrieleño Tongva people. We show our respect to them, as well as all First Peoples, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as original tariff takers of this land. The Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrieleño Tongva community. We invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. I'm sure that all of you are as excited as I am about today's program in conjunction with the exhibition, Games and Pastimes in the Middle Ages, now on view in the Manuscripts Gallery in the North Pavilion of the Getty Museum. This exhibition was curated by Dr. Nava Strider, previous graduate intern in the Department of Manuscripts, who will also be moderating today's panel. For those of you who have not yet seen the exhibition in person, I highly recommend a trip to see it, especially as you have just five days left before it closes on August 6th. For today, please feel free to submit any questions you might have into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And now I will turn it over to my colleague Nava to introduce the exhibition and today's panelists. Hi. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, and thank you, uh, of course, to the Getty and especially to the Public Programs Department for pulling together this really cool panel. Um, as Beth said, I developed the show as a grad intern working in the manuscripts department. Um, we're looking at a few gallery shots of the show that I hope will give you a sense of the lighthearted and interactive nature of the exhibition, um, which we're using to lure visitors into the deep dark world of medieval play. Uh, in truth, to me, this show is basically about how broad medieval play was. It could definitely be fun and whimsical, but it was also profound um, and often even dangerous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us through a few images and I'm going to talk really specifically about how we can read them visually as commentaries on medieval play. I hope that this is going to get us thinking about uh, how games and uh, pictures of games can give us insight into a broader culture. So first and maybe foremost, the show puts manuscripts in conversation with one another. Both of these paintings show chess, which developed in Asia, but became a really hot pastime in medieval Europe. Um, at the top, we see a diagram from a literal 14th century chess manual with instructions on different plays and strategies. At the bottom, it, it's a small image from a medieval storybook where chess symbolizes the wit and strategy that the characters in the story are going to have to display later in the narrative. And I like to imagine that these are the skills that the chess manual is trying to teach its contemporary audience. Um, here's another depiction of play that's a little bit more oblique. It's a calendar page for the month of May, and its two scenes depict the game of love. So at the left, we've got this super glamorous young couple riding off into the woods together. Um, medieval people thought that May was the proper month for courting. In theory, medieval love was bound by a whole bunch of rules of propriety. Um, on the right, we've got the zodiac sign, uh, the symbol of the zodiac sign for Gemini, which was also associated with May in the Middle Ages. <laughs> It's very conventional imagery, and the, the twins are uh, sort of frequently nude, but I like to think that the artist of this scene really knew what they were doing, um, placing one young blonde couple riding off together into the woods right next to another young, blonde, stark naked, wildly embracing couple in essentially the same woods. What I'm getting at um, is that half of the fun of the show, half of the fun of these images, is thinking about how play was rendered in the Middle Ages, especially at what gets suggested or elided um, or just left implicit. So for example, uh, this image shows a famous knight named Jacques de la Lange. He's the guy in armor, a little off center, 
riding up to greet a king before a very big tournament. And at first glance, this looks like a super chaotic scene. There's all these colors and textures and all these diagonal lines going all over the place. But the longer you sit with it, the more you see its stability and its very careful organization. So Jacques' gesture and the trumpets uh, opposite him point our gaze up to the king who sits in this very symmetrical royal box that anchors the whole composition with the framing mirrored tents at the sides. Um, his gaze locks onto Jacques, drawing us back down to our hero. The whole thing is underlain by this real sense of order and stability, and it's framed by this illusionistic gold frame that really contains the figures. So to me, this image is a reminder that the vitality and even the violence of medieval tournament culture was inextricable from uh, aristocratic etiquette and ideals in the Middle Ages. Um, the final image, uh, the other manuscripts in the show uh, compared to Jacques let their figures roam a lot more freely. So what we're looking at here is a page from a prayer book under a really big block of religious text, which is very conventional text and actually contains a, in, in the small scene in the letter C, a grim image of the biblical massacre of the innocents. We have these three ordinary children playing a game. Um, and the game isn't labeled. We think it's probably a medieval precursor to modern checkers. Um, but what I love about this is that the game is framed within the universe of the manuscript. There's almost an illusion that some of the characters have the autonomy to engage in activities outside the conventional bounds of the text. So what I'm getting at is that medieval manuscripts like modern games can and often do engage in a really complex world building um, that is itself both playful and meaningful. And that brings me uh, to the real reason we're here, our wonderful panelists who are uh, experts on the topic of design and world building. Um, first, we're gonna hear from Dr. Alf Siegert, who's an English professor at the University of Utah and the creator of several fabulous medievalizing board games, including uh, Illumination on the Road to Canterbury, next Dorota Halitska, um, art director Yaza Games will talk about the beautiful and, and wonderfully silly digital combat game in Kulinati, which draws imagery very concretely from medieval manuscripts. Um, and finally, Hannah Kennedy from Obsidian Entertainment, <clears throat> will tell us about her work as the art director of the adventure role-playing game Pentiment, um, which is set in an early modern Europe uh, that is complete with incredibly well-researched and, and gorgeous settings and, and sort of narrative details. And then we're all gonna come back together for what I hope will be a lively and, and chill panel discussion. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn the little green speaking box over to Dr. Siegert. Thank you so much, Nava. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm Dr. Alf Seeger at the University of Utah. Um, today, I'm here in my capacities as a board game designer. Um, let me share my screen so we can take a look at the board games I want to talk about. Okay, I trust that that is working. Someone let me know if it isn't. Um, so um, among the 12 games that I've designed, I have a couple of them that are set in the Middle Ages. The Road to Canterbury, which first came out about a decade ago, and Illumination, which came out about two or three years ago. Um, and so what got this all started? Started, if I can get my computer to cooperate, was this image right here. Um, this is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch dating from around 1500, and it's called The Seven Deadly Sins and the Four Last Things. And this was painted on wood, and it was described in the image that I saw as a tabletop. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but when I saw the words tabletop and then saw this image, I thought, this is a game board. I really wanted to make a game out of this because you have like four nice areas here. You have the deathbed, you have the last judgment, you've got hell, you've got heaven, but then around the center here where Christ is watching all like a big eyeball, you have the seven deadly sins. You've got wrath down at the bottom, you have envy, then you have greed, you have gluttony, you have um, 
Let's see, what is this one right here? Um, that would be idleness or sloth. We have extravagance or lust or luxury. Um, they all kind of bled into each other. It's a conversation of its own. Lots of discussion on Board Game Geek about that. Um, and then pride. And I thought how much fun it would be to have a game where you are maybe tempting someone to commit the deadly sins, for example. Well, I was at the same time teaching a class on um, intellectual traditions. And among the many texts we were looking at was the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, which many of you are already know is a 14th century um, series of stories about pilgrims um, all going on pilgrimage to Canterbury. And they're telling very funny, very bawdy stories to each other as they go along. Um, this is an image from the Ellesmere manuscript from the early 15th century. And the game that ultimately came out of all this would use all of the artwork from the Ellesmere combined with art from Hieronymus Bosch, a sort of unholy combination I'm a big fan of here. So that's Geoffrey Chaucer shown up there. And the character or the pilgrim who interested me the most is this one. This is the pardoner, and the pardoner was someone who would dispense um, relics and pardons to make pilgrims feel good about their spiritual journeys, not just the journey on the ground. Um, because the pardoner, um, he's a self-professed charlatan in the text of the Canterbury Tales. In his prologue, he admits that he's dealing phony things, but his goal is to make as much money as possible by selling pardons as a way, not exactly to forgive sins, but to allow people to reduce the amount of time they have to spend working off the debt that they've incurred from committing sins in life. So it reduced the amount of time they spent in purgatory. So this ultimately is what the game looked like. We have the seven deadly sins all separated out in little spaces here. This is the parson, not the pardoner, denouncing a particular sin. These cubes mark the different sins that you are tempting pilgrims to commit. And the pilgrims show up here, here, and here, and they will change as the game goes along here. But they're all taken straight from the Canterbury Tales. They each have their own pet sin. And in the game, your goal is to tempt them to commit sins because you have to actually keep yourself in business, not just by forgiving sins, but by tempting pilgrims to commit the very sins that you turn around to forgive them of. But the catch is these are the seven deadly sins. So your customer base starts to die off as you do this. So it's a really interesting interplay of events. Here are some of the cards here. The three cards here are different sins that you would tempt pilgrims with. And this would be an example of a papal indulgence that you would play in order to be able to um, forgive, again, remit the amount of time in purgatory that the pilgrim would have to spend. But the idea is that it builds up in sort of a press your luck mechanic. So the more that a pilgrim sins in a particular way, the more money you'll make for giving it. But if it goes too far, then they'll die. All right, the second game here is called Illumination. This one is based on illuminated manuscripts, and that's gonna be the thread that I think com com that connects all the different games that we're looking at today. The art style you'll notice here is a mix of more static medieval. These are pretty much straight, this one and this one, straight representations um, from medieval manuscripts like the Croy Book of Hours, et cetera, but others are much more modern. This was sort of a compromise. Jake Tomashow, really great artist, um, among other things is a graffiti artist who lives in Tasmania, last I checked, um, what he did is he gave a sense of movement to images that would otherwise be static because we don't have the benefits of animation like a video game would. And so in the game, you are a reverent and an irreverent monk duking it out on the pages of an illuminated manuscript with different archetypal characters. So you have knights, versus dragons, you have demons versus angels, and then the eternal struggle of dogs versus squirrels. Um, and then monks and rabbits, which I'm sure much can be said about dogs and rabbits. I'm sure Nava and others will comment on that. And I think Dorota especially will have something to say. Um, and here's what the um, different playing mats look like in the game. You start to fill these illuminated manuscripts with your own um, set of characters. But what interested me so much about what Jake did is the amount of detail he brought to a 21st century interpretation of an illuminated manuscript here. Um, I would have to talk to him to find out, but this feels very Studio Ghibli, like something out of Princess Mononoke or My Neighbor Totoro as an interpretation of what's going on. And here, yes, the rabbit. More to be said on that. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for this presentation. It was great. Uh, right now, I will share my screen. OK. So again, hello, everyone. My name is Dorota Halicka. I'm art director in Inculinati, a video game made by Polish studio Yaza Games. 
I was responsible for the initial art idea, research, graphics, most of the animation and overall art direction of the game. What is Inculinati? It's a turn-based strategy game straight from, straight from medieval manuscripts where a rabbit's bum can be deadlier than a dog's sword. In Inculinati, we play the role of medieval illuminator skilled in the use of living king. We draw beasts with which we play duels on the pages of manuscripts. Initial idea. Around 2018, during my game development course, I look at every image I saw as a potential candidate for game art inspiration. One day, I came across a piece of medieval marginalia on the internet, dogs fighting rabbits in the margins of medieval manuscripts. I was delighted. I immediately showed my discovery to the team. We agreed to create a game based on this fascinating world. Watching all these references, we wondered, as did many historians before us, what was the meaning of marginalia? We came up with the idea that there used to be a secret group of scribes and eliminators called the Inculinati. They know how to use a magical substance called living king. They use it to draw their own armies and duel with each other on the pages of medieval manuscripts. And the marginalia we can see today in digitized collections are the remains of these duels. While working on the game, I started each day by searching for medieval marginalia pieces. From the references I collected, I selected only those with a cartoonish look and strong outline. On this basis, I developed a special Inculinati art style. All characters from the Inculinati are based on original sources from hundreds of years ago. Every character has their own medieval reference. Our bishop cut, for example, is mostly based on the bishop cut from the Getty collection. Moreover, everything is seen from the perspective of the person drawing on the pages of the book. This allows us to see a realistic background outside the book during the gameplay and the hands of the character you are playing. Apart from the visual side of medieval marginalia, we also incorporated medieval beliefs, jokes and folklore to our beasts' behaviors, animations and actions. We mix them with modern meme culture, which I believe is some form of modern folklore culture. Our bishop cut sounds like a cut from popular meme and behaves like another. So each character in Inculinati has their own visual reference in medieval manuscripts. Animation and nature of characters are inspired by some modern memes and their special actions are based on medieval beliefs and legends. In Inculinati bishop cut, in addition, in addition to the regular actions such as walk and push has its own special actions pray, purr, and bless. The variety of beasts that the player can use on the various battlefields and the number of hand actions that can be used by the player results in a visually unique and playful game with a challenging strategy depth. In Kulinati bridge gap between medieval and modern. Our game show that medieval people also have their own jokes, satires, and sense of humor. Inculinati allows some people, especially the younger generation, to discover medieval marginalia and progress in this topic. Thank you. <laughs> right now, I, will, I, I would like to invite Hannah. But at the first, I need to, sorry, <laughs> I need to, uh, oh, great. Thank Hi. You. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Hannah Kennedy art director on Pentiment, which was released last year by Obsidian Entertainment. So Pentiment is a narrative adventure game that is set in 16th century Bavaria, where you follow journeyman artist Andreas Mailer as he lives and works alongside the monks, townspeople, and the peasants of Tassing, and is eventually drawn into a series of murders and scandals within the community. The game is set in a time where the world was transitioning from hand illuminated manuscripts to print media. Um, and this was really important to our story. So we wanted the look of the game to reflect this. 
uh, this setting and this time period was something that our game director, Josh Sawyer, was really personally passionate about. And lots of members of the team brought their own passions, either for myself with printmaking and kind of history in a general sense. Um, and so we wanted the art style and all of the features that we brought to the game to be as supportive to that setting as we could. Um, so yeah, this exploration of the art style being something that was supportive narratively to the goals of the story and also to be accessible and interesting to a modern audience of video games was kind of the greater challenge and interesting part of the role that I got to play in this project. The world space of the game is set within the illustrations of a book, and here you have the freedom to explore the town, abbey, and surrounding areas in order to collect information. Uh, this scene is an example that you see at the beginning of the game. Uh, the style is different. Uh, it contrasts to some of what you've already seen of the woodcut nature, because this is an imagined scene. So we got to explore a little bit of what that means from perspective and point of view from the characters, where the literal game space was set in this sort of, at the time, modern woodcut aesthetic, um, but in other areas, either when a character is telling a story or having an internal experience, we got to expand that sort of more limiting art style to other genres of art of the time period, which was a lot of fun and I think added variety to the game. Uh, in addition to wandering and exploring to find information about various cases and larger uh, narrative beats, we wanted the player to experience small personal moments with individuals within the game, such as uh, meals like this one shown here, which is you sitting across the table from other characters in conversation and actually, you know, interacting with various objects and meals uh, that are set in front of you. Uh, and spinning B mini games, which is just a very fun moment where we got to kind of bridge history and interactive gameplay in this moment that was sort of the housing for a conversation uh, that we used to move the story forward. The illustrations of the world space also expand into the margins of this book that the story lives, uh, which you can see here we use this as kind of a um, a glossary space and just more contextual information in addition to featuring some of the fun imagery that we fell in love with when researching the um, history and the kind of different pieces of media that we are referencing here. Uh, Andreas also has a journal that gives context to other uh, features in the game and shows the contrast between a more informal handwritten sort of uh, piece of literature like that versus these really refined uh, illuminations that the scribes were doing for the church. The goals of this were also to allow the player to feel more like they were personally discovering the story themselves, like it was in their hands, um, and show a variety of different uh, types of art from the time period. And this is an example of a marginalia piece that we included in the intro of the game. Uh, that is one of the ones that was shared earlier within the Getty collection. And on that, I would love to return to our other panelists and have us all join the conversation moving forward. Hi, Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am nerding out hard. I can't tell you how many times I laughed with the light during those presentations. <laughs> um, so I thought we would start, you know, with a really fundamental topic, which you kind of addressed, but I was wondering if anyone could reflect a little bit more concretely on why medieval, why early modern? You could have set these games in space. How did you know that this would resonate with a public? Does anyone want to get us started on it? I can jump in for this one. Um, we chose a very specific sort of time period within this historical range where it was this transition space between um, something, a topic, in our case, the art and the structure of books being done in a certain way for a long time and then transitioning to a new one. And in that space, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting social aspects that resonate with modern people that come up. Um, there's tension of sort of the societal pressures, uh, the contrast of different types of people that are shown. Um, and there's just a lot of interesting content that comes up in a space where um, 
a society is transitioning from one large movement to another. So uh, in addition to this just being uh, a time period that our uh, game director and narrative director really personally enjoyed, that particular slice of where it landed uh, was done for that reason, so that those topics we felt were very sort of universal topics that anyone could relate to because they're still very relevant in society today. I think in the case of my games, um, there is, I like making games with villains in them. Uh, I have a game called Bridge Troll, where instead of playing travelers trying to cross a bridge, you play the troll and you eat the travelers or you extort them. Um, and it's nice to play a, a villain who is safely distant so you can do that safely without feeling like a bad guy. Whereas um, if you did some, you know, someone from today, it might feel really different. But if you distance something into a fantastical setting or a thousand years ago or something like that, it can get pretty interesting. And so I like the idea of being a cackling partner. Like if any of you are Black Adder fans, I would want a Black Adder episode based on the kind of board games that I made, where if you're playing a corrupt partner, you're corrupting quotes. It's fun. It's it's almost kind of sweet. It's quaint to go on a pilgrimage and build pilgrims out of their gullibility. And that seems like it speaks to something which is distanced enough that you can have fun with that as opposed to someone who's you know doing something with the housing crisis you know with, with the mortgage crisis of 2008 you don't want to make a game about that and people's actual lives ruined right so there's something about the world itself the romance the simplicity but also the distance in in, in Klinati case it was uh, because of the animals behaving as humans and I think every culture will have their own stories and tales with animals. So we chose um, this marginalia setting because uh, in the, uh, we have uh, animals behaving as humans, but also monsters, dragons, uh, knights uh, fighting with snails. And it was uh, totally um, delightful in some way. And we chose this uh, setting uh, be because of that. <laughs> Yeah, some things are immortal. We are never going to get tired of dogs chasing bunnies and fighting snails. Um, so in the process of figuring out how to create a game that resonated very directly, but also had an appropriate level of distance, you guys all in different ways had to adapt your source material for modern audiences. What was that like? What were the challenges? What were the, the opportunities? Uh, maybe I will uh, ask uh, answer this question uh, firstly. Um, in our uh, case, it was um, we wanted to show that people from medieval times also have their own jokes and satires and uh, medieval. It's not only grim and dull, but uh, also uh, the people from this uh, from this time have uh, some fun. And we wanted to show that this uh, particular um, topic, but also I think uh, medieval marginalia still are hidden uh, in some way. And not everyone uh, knows that uh, during medieval times, uh, people uh, put uh, funny uh, pictures uh, in the margins of the medieval books. So, yes. It's such a charming, thing too when you realize sort of where these images lived historically and who was making them and, and why they were being made. Uh, it's undeniable that the contrast between the source material that they're writing, you know, the what's on the pages of these papers that they were adding these little cartoons to, like that contrast is so extreme sometimes, like the example that Nava showed earlier. Um, they had to have just been doing it for fun. That personally delighted them. Uh, and that that was something that in doing research was really exciting to me. Um, as far as speaking on the challenge of adapting the source material to the modern purpose that we wanted to use it for, uh, the, the tininess of these images and how they were made and the amount of detail included that in them was something that we knew we were going to have to adapt to some degree. Um, because we knew we wanted to have a sort of side-scrolling point and click motion. Um, you control your character world space that we wanted to feel like it was in depth that you could explore and it would expand. Um, so we wanted these images to show a lot of space in them. 
But as soon as you start to shrink things like the characters, if they are rendered in a style that was really authentic to the way that they looked on the pages, like a lot of times those were very tiny illustrations and it was, you know, just the characters and they'd have very flattened, abstracted backgrounds. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to do that and also make our scene spaces and the controls of the game feel comfortable and be easily understood to a player that was, you know, navigating Andreas in this world. So we knew that that was something that we needed to resolve in addition to just making this, um, you know, not too visually noisy overall that you could pick out interactable things in a scene from things that weren't interactable. You know, the world's kind of your oyster when you're looking at your whole screen full of information, um, but that can get really overwhelming really quickly. I think particularly with the images that we wanted to mimic looking like woodcuts, if you look at Durer's work, which was a huge inspiration to um, both our topics, uh, Andreas himself and a lot of the imagery that we use, but there's all this hatching and internal information. And if you overlay that on top of each other, as soon as it starts to move, it's like, whoa, <laughs> what is going on? Um, so we pulled a lot of inspiration from other pieces of modern animation that's referenced the same source material. We looked at what other games were doing um, and tried to pull in some of like, how are they simplifying these things? How are they making it so that you can clearly decipher information on a page while still feeling like this is clearly referencing the source material that it does? One of the things that interests me is the way that resistance and satire are framed in different cultures, um, because that impulse to resist systems of power without getting in trouble for it is, that's always going to be the case. How can you do it? Um, and humor is a way that's been universal as a way to do this sort of thing. And so I see this sort of Python-esque impulse in things like Chaucer, but also in illuminated manuscripts where you have snails and you have rabbits that are, you know, dissecting humans, right? Um, that they're the ones that are now empowered. It's got like a sort of carnival on the page of inverting power hierarchies. And I can't help but think that monks, for example, and those who are illuminating these are getting a sense of vicarious thrill of being able to represent what they only wish could happen by having these cartoon characters embody it. It keeps it safe, but also entertaining. Humor is this universal way to keep doing that. Yes, and in Inclinati, we uh, try to choose only uh, funny references and uh, silly in some way. We uh, try to avoid uh, very dif difficult uh, subjects. And for example, very vulgar images, because uh, it's also um, present in medieval marginalia. And uh, because of that, because we uh, try, try, uh, we tried to focus only on uh, silliness and playfulness. Uh, our game in Kulinati is uh, accessible for broader audience in some way, I think. Yeah, I think the, the emphasis on humor and what gets hidden in the sort of physical technology of the manuscript seems like it's super important. Uh, Hannah, I want to go back to something that you said sort of in passing that you guys looked at other games that are inspired by, by history, especially by the Middle Ages. Did you all do that? Why do you, what is this trend? Why are games in general looking at the Middle Ages, not just yours, but... Why, why is this happening? It's such a big jump, but it's so compelling. Yeah. Um, well, my context, my my tether to that, as, as a reference, we looked at a lot of the cartoon saloon bodies of work. So Secret of Kells is a great one where it's the mm -hmm. it's right in the title, you know? Um, and that I know to them was both a regional history that they were passionate about. Um, but I think for a lot of artists, like I'm coming to a game development perspective with a creative background and a training in 2D art. And so you look at the spectrum of history of art and how it was made, and there's just slices of it that are particularly interesting to you. And I think the bridge between modern animations, which is something that pulls in a lot of modern artists, it's a, it's a medium that's really exciting right now. It's one of the things that is most compelling to me looking at the modern art, modern art that's being made. Uh, the, but the precursor to that really early was, you know, comics and cartooning. And then earlier than that was these storytelling images on pages. Like these are kind of the the, the source root of all of those modern practices today, tracing back and something that we share with a lot of other ones mutually because it did bridge out into modern illustration, modern animation, modern game making. So I think from the creative perspective, that's something that 
we lots of different genres of, of people on the the teams that are making them share those passions um it was interesting when we talked to our um advertising group that was working with us to create our initial launch trailer and they're coming from a, a graphic design marketing perspective and when we mentioned that like this is a game about print they were like yes <laughs> because they had that same sort of history passions um, that brought them to their careers as well so I think that was something that when you see it popping up in lots of different storytelling modern creative media that's that's one of the things is um, not just for the audience but for the people on the teams making the things they all kind of share that own personal passion for that source material Material. Um, we're going to have a minute. Sorry, sorry, Alf. At, at the end, um, to to look at the questions in the chats. Um, but I just noticed someone, Edward Elliott, asked, "Do you foresee game design being recognized as a fine art form, especially in the museum setting?" And it just seems so germane to your response, like you're actually like coming from arts or literature backgrounds and and creating a form of art that's super underrecognized in the fine arts world. Is that the the sort of connective tissue that it's just a continuation? I think for the people involved, um, that's part of it. I think that's one of the things that I find most exciting about game development overall is how many different backgrounds people come to the table on a dev team. Um, there are lots of people that do specifically train for game design, um, but I would say a majority of the people don't necessarily arrive from that place um you know I think and personally some of the game designers I've had the most fun working with are people that are coming from different backgrounds like if someone was to apply for a position on a team and say well you know I have an architecture background or something I didn't train for development I'm like oh, that's great we have so many buildings in games and a lot of people don't actually know how buildings mm -hmm. are made so you know games are a medium that includes absolutely everything in them sky is the limit of what can be in a game so the more people with the more training backgrounds that can be a part of that process and authentically influence you know what what is being talked about what is being played um I think you get more interesting and more potentially experimental yeah. games made that way. I was going to give a, a more lowbrow response because I, 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 games are art. And there's no question about that. But I think it's no coincidence that 1974 was the year that Dungeons and Dragons and Monty Python and the Holy Grail came out. And the geeks have grown up. We're now making things, right? The Dungeons and Dragons movie, thankfully a really good one this time, um, just came out, right? And the 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 fact that games like Dark Souls, all the different fantasy games, et cetera, I think that this is becoming ubiquitous language now for games, for popular culture. And I just, I can't see a game like Pentiment having come out 10 years ago. I just feel like there had to be something that made this so... Um, appealing that people wanted to dig in and do a game that has world building, which is really, really outstanding. I almost feel like they needed Dark Souls first to be given a fantasy world that has diegetic storytelling, right? Storytelling that comes out by examining the artifacts, examining the architecture, etc., and then being given a game that really dives into actual history, like Pentiment, that now we're ready for that. That in a sense, the geeks have grown up and they're now ready to do games as art. Yeah. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I I also think that uh, because of uh, changes in uh, from the techno technolo technological side, uh, uh, it's uh, for example for me it was uh, possible to uh, flipping through the pages of uh, digitized manuscripts, and uh, only because of that uh, I think my research was uh, possible <laughs> in some way. And I think because of these changes, uh, people are more um, know uh, more about history and uh, about art and about for example marginalia because of the uh, public domain and digitized manuscripts and you spoke in your introduction about meme culture as a type of folklore <laughs> and medieval manuscript meanings i mean maybe in a really rarefied section of society a hundred years ago but it didn't really hit the sort of popular zeitgeist until fairly recently. I'd love to hear more about how memes are folklore and how that becomes a game. I think uh, it's because of some weird uh, abstract tradition. Uh, it's sometimes it's, I think it's totally abstract, 
because one guy uh, put a video with uh, himself uh, singing some song, uh, for example, and uh, people from the internet chose to uh, match, match it with uh, appearance of the frog. And uh, before of that, uh, right now, uh, every Wednesday, people on the internet put uh, um, images with frog. So I think maybe people uh, in the, mm, maybe not right now, but uh, maybe in the future, uh, have some kind of studies, studies of, of these topics. I think too, like, in the parallel is really interesting about how cartooning and these images from this historical setting, you know, sometimes they were added like in the margins for enjoyment from uh, the scribe that was making them like a, a personal pleasure from them. But also there was a contrast between a, a large part of the population um, that could read the text at all versus you know, people that couldn't read. And so the images are then what is being used to communicate with the largest amount of people that can be at the time. And I think that parallel with memes is interestingly similar, not that memes are for people that can't enjoy other types of content, but it's immediate, you know, and with the internet and with all yes. the formats that people are consuming content, it is fast, it is really catches your emotional hooks really quickly and really um, effectively and the they're just the same in that way like honestly I get so endeared by and some of my favorite pieces of art are ones that uh, you know in history are ones that were very obviously done to be funny in some capacity because they're still funny like that still just yes. holds true today and that's so like genuinely beautiful to me yeah it's so important to remember that people were ridiculous a thousand <laughs> years ago um i love the idea mm -hmm. of you know memes as sort of a form of agency that you get this like received core of an image or a text or something and then you're allowed to change it which is sort of what you guys are doing uh, when, when you make games that are based really concretely in history so I'd love to hear more about how you use medieval stories, medieval narratives in your games. Um, how, how do you decide whose story you want to tell and, and how, who you want people to inhabit as they're playing your games? So in, in Inclinati, uh, we chose uh, funny side of medieval manuscripts. Uh, and we want to make a game, uh, ho uh, make a game which is uh, funny and playful, but also uh, have a uh, strategic depth. And we try to use um, the most, uh, uh, for example, dogs and uh, rabbits, but uh, creatures who uh, appears uh, more, <laughs> who appears <laughs> uh, in the manuscripts, okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that for a game like Pentiment and what we were trying to do with the story, especially coming from a studio that frequently makes RPGs, which people often kind of expect to be provided with the blank slate character they get to create whoever they want with. We knew that to bridge this thing that we wanted to do with making this a historical piece and telling a specific story, um, we wanted the player to have agency over Andreas and maybe be able to impact his personality, but who he was and what his story was set up to be at the beginning of the game was fixed. Um, and in doing that, we I think we're able to tell a little bit more of an authentic story and put that character in a more authentic context within the story so that we could focus on some things that maybe would be a little bit alienating to a modern audience because it feels very different um for example the contrast between the peasantry versus the townspeople versus the monastery and the monastery and how it was interacted um and kind of so involved in the life of the townspeople um that's something that not a lot of modern people can you know in be able to relate to today but for Andreas we could say like well he can he's he's from there and and that kind of allowed us to put the player in the story without 
being disloyal to how that story would work. I think that was true for um, some things where we we took some liberties with some things that were asynchronous maybe to uh, what was common in history at the time. We wanted to have both a split uh, monastic setup so that there were nuns and monks present. And part of that was just to make sure that we were able to include a lot of the stories of women in the time period in a way that um, was important to represent as a part of society at the time, but wouldn't commonly be placed right next to a, a monastery that was primarily uh, monks living there. It did, there was examples that that happened, but that was an instance where we said, okay, we're going to stretch maybe what was common here to facilitate including a wider variety of, of stories. Um, and uh, yeah, we wanted the player to feel like they could influence what was happening and be a part of it without um, having Andreas be a blank slate avatar character. With respect to board games, um, I'm a big fan of emergent storytelling. Um, the notion that stories don't just come at you, but from you, because there's different types of board games that have stories in them. Some of them have lots of detailed paragraphs that you read, a choose your own adventure style or whatnot. Um, the games I make tend to be a lot more spare and leave a lot more room for the players to come up with their own narratives if they want to, they don't have to. So they occupy this uncanny borderland between a Euro style board game and a storytelling game. Um, with the latest edition of the to Canterbury, for example, each of the pilgrims has um, snippets of text from the Middle English attached to them. So you can, you know, you could role play if you wanted to how you're exploiting their weaknesses to tempt them to commit particular sins, etc. as you go on um, this pilgrimage. Um, and I think there's a real value to emergent storytelling because it gives so much room for individual players to put on a performance. I mean, making a game is a really strange thing because you're creating something with so much potential to be different no matter who's playing. And this is one of the reasons I like games that have a lot of openness, because if they're overly scripted as a board game, it can feel rehearsed. You've done this a thousand times before or whatnot. Um, I wanted to just shout out, I totally agree, Hannah, with what you were saying about the value of a, of a character with very strong traits, as opposed to the blank slate character. It made absolute sense in this case that they're you are enabling their journey more than you are actually expressing your individual self. And I think we need more of that in games. I really, really like that. It definitely so you, helped in a, in a narrative setting specifically. Um, I think not all games that's necessary to have an engaging story, but for one that we wanted to tie in personal player experience and history, we definitely felt that that was a, was a strong addition to that. You guys all have kind of a God's eye view of games. Like I, I've studied play and looked at a lot of pictures of play, but I've never designed a game. Um, I assume you guys have also all played a lot of games. What's the difference in designing a game? Is it a form of play? How conscious are these choices as you're working through them? For me, uh, some kind of play was uh, searching through the manuscripts and uh, trying to find uh, great reference. So I think this, this uh, topic was some kind of play for me personally. It's, yeah. it's a, oh, go ahead, Anna, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say in my experience with games and people that make them in general, they have to be excited about and having fun with the game. You, you won't know if it's landing with other people. Um, and inversely, like, if there is something that you find fun, I believe there's an audience for it out there somewhere. Um, you know, there are players that would also enjoy it because it's a thing that is play to you. So in, in all the cases that I think there have been games that turned out really well, I think people on those teams do, do experience their own play and their own joy from the thing that they're making. Um, and, and that comes through and makes the game all that much better. I mean, there's the adage of write what you know when really it's write what you want to know because you have to learn so much to write something. It's the same with board games. Um, I'm almost always hit by a, an image or a theme or something more than I am a mechanic. Um, when I saw that Hieronymus Bosch image, I was like, I have to make a game about that. I hope it's a good one. Um, I want to do a quick shout out to Joe Richardson, who made a video game called The Four Last Things, which is a Terry Gilliam esque, wonderful, wonderful video game that runs with that in some really great directions. Um, but with respect to games as play, it's a great question because I think it is definitely a kind of play. I'd much rather spend my time 
embarrassingly designing rather than playing, I think, at this point. But there's the adage of follow the fun. Um, some people have this idea, I'm, I'm going to make a game and it's going to be like this. When I'm much more of a gardener than a blueprinter, I'd much rather have some idea that I'm working with. And then you follow the fun. Things won't work. Most stuff won't work that you try to do. And then the thing that does work will surprise you. It's the weed in the garden that turns out to be the most beautiful flower. And that's the one you cultivate, right? And you follow that. And the game, if ideally, will design itself through you. Um, Mark Brown of Game Makers Toolkit has a wonderful video about this, about games that design themselves. Um, that doesn't mean you don't have to labor, but you try to become transparent and you just get out of the way. So you can become the servo mechanism for the game making itself through you as as opposed to acting like there's this heroic notion of an artist creator, it's all coming from you, when really it's coming through you. You're a conduit for this, ideally. Sorry, Druid uh, vanished for a second. Um, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> it's really, as you said, conduit. Um, it's fascinating to hear that. Are there games that you guys think it, the market needs, that people need to play? Are there characters that you still want to make? You know everything being possible. I am personally excited to see any sort of a game that I, I haven't seen in certain ways before, just because when there is a new game um, that is a really unusual or unexpected theme, when I see that, it is indicative to me that there's someone that's really excited about that theme that's making that game. And there are so many games and it is relatively so accessible to publish games these days that uh, why bother making ones unless you're really excited about what it is that you're telling. Like it is a socially shared experience. It is a narrative experience, which is innately social. Like this is something that you want to bring to share with other people in some way. So. Um, yeah, I, the games I get the most excited about anymore are ones that are pushing what people expect a game to be, maybe take a new topic, um, explore things like uh, just just topics that are not within the genres that you expect out of out of board games or out of um, out of uh, video games. And I think that that's where some of the most interesting and the most engaging things uh, come from where the market kind of is right now. The, the two video games that to me I'm most excited about that are relatively recent um, are Citizen Sleeper by Gareth Demi and Martin. Talk about a name to follow. Their work is astonishing. It's taking narrative and games in such a great direction. Um, and that seems to be doing very well. Um, but also the game Wildermyth. Um, if any, if you haven't played Wildermyth, it is a wonderful um, role-playing game. It's a computer game in that you don't just play by the standard rules. It's narrative-centered. So when you have a character who's about to die, you don't drink a bunch of potions. You don't save and then back up and restart. You let your character die or be dismembered or whatnot or have a final blast of glory as they go down. And who knows if their children will carry on with the adventure next. You live through generation after generation in the game, and it's really centered on characters building relationships as opposed to this sort of standard model of hack and slash role playing. And so I'm really excited to see where that's going because that is procedurally generated crossed with a bunch of pre-curated narratives to create a really satisfying experience. Yeah, that's Wildermyth. Another thing I find exciting about Wildermyth, particularly that is unusual um, that you don't often see with, with games of different structures is that they make their tools that they use to construct these modules mm -hmm. that they're telling stories with them very public. So yeah. they give it to the players to essentially like, hey, here's everything we use to create the content we put into the game. You can make your own now. And that engagement, like that relationship with the players and allowing them to be a part of like modding and making their own adaptations of the game, I think is super exciting. It sounds like a totally revolutionary moment which is really cool. And especially with the advent of VR and more AIs. Um, I see that we are unfortunately coming closer to time, but fortunately we have tons of really cool questions in the Q and A. Um, so I thought that we could just step back and I'd run through some of the ones that are most relevant to the conversation. Um, I really like why were animals used in games? Um, Dorota, maybe you can just mm -hmm. take that a little more explicitly. <laughs> uh, so can you repeat the question? Why were animals used in games? Okay. Uh, uh, 
Okay, I don't know how to. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I understand correctly this question. Um, yeah, I think used in games or chosen okay. as the source material for like okay, so, why were uh, okay, animals selected okay. in margins. Oh, thank you, thank you, Hannah. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. Uh, I think uh, all culture have their stories with animals and I think people like to see themselves in animals uh, somehow uh, and probably it's easier uh, telling some stories or making jokes uh, from the uh, um, another person with a uh, picture of animal I think so it's some some universal theme uh, and people are doing this all the time and in all region in all periods in time so i think we are doing the same all all the time <laughs> in history and i think it's great because uh animals behaving as humans are great 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 fun and uh, they're instantly silly sometimes and uh, it's uh, I like uh, jokes, especially uh, during COVID, for example. It was um, it was great to work on a game uh, who who is uh, silly uh, on on silly game <laughs> and uh, playful because uh, times was uh, were hard and uh, because of our game uh, we felt better. I think in our office uh, and if we are not in the office. <laughs> We still felt better because of our uh, topic and uh, graphics, for example. It was, uh, it, for example, I need to, um, sometimes I need to make um, a, 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 a different expressions to draw something. And uh, if uh, even if I have a, a bad time or bad day, if I see this rabbit and I need to uh, draw something funny, it was instantly better. I felt instantly better. So I think it's uh, universal for all the people. Yeah, no, totally a universal source of joy. It's wonderful yes. to hear that this like got you through COVID with you know like a sense of good spirits. Um, anonymous attendee asks, um, building off something that Hannah just said. Uh, what historical element was too difficult to make into a compelling game mechanic? Mm. Hmm. Um, well, I'll say it's something, this example is something that we did end up ultimately including, but we simplified a lot because of the challenges that it presented. So one thing we wanted to show was the contrast of how modern society thinks about time and how people then thought about time um, and featured the canonical hours, the monastic hours and the way that those kind of break it down. So in the final game, there is a time wheel that shows these chunks of times and their names and how they worked. They were kind of equivalents of generally about three hour blocks of times and, you know, people weren't using clocks then. So that was that was a big difference. Um, and initially we wanted our world to be very reactive to these canonical hours and we thought that that was going to be how we would have the player notice that difference and feel it so we wanted to schedule every single character in the game at any of these hours being in a totally different spot and have you be able to track like where they go and and all these people moving and you know they're working in the fields now they're working over here um but we just realized at a certain point with the size we, we thought it was more valuable for the story that we wanted to tell to be able to include a wider number of characters than to have this really intricate system of scheduling where they move all over the place. Um, for our team size and the tools that we had and for the player experience that just started to bog things down. Um, so we reduced that feature a lot and made it basically just how the clock was displayed um, because ultimately it just didn't serve the goals that we thought but I do think that was an interesting challenge the reason the why that was challenging was just because that's such a different way of thinking about time than modern people do very much um Shoshana Seidman asks how do you think these types of games will fare in the virtual reality VR avenue if if at, at all or just theoretically how might they fare how might they transform? I think Inculinati um, in some way can be transformed to um, 
a simulator of uh, illuminator <laughs> in some way in vr so i think it's because i don't uh, i can imagine uh, in some way uh, 2d uh, rabbits in virtual world so i think maybe sim sim simulator of scribe i think the humor would carry over because vr is such a by design 3d space and all of our games reference 2D art. So like how that would transfer and be shown in that world um, is definitely something interesting to think about. It, it would be, uh, you know, kind of paper cutty or um, yeah, yeah. It's wild possibilities. Might be nightmare fodder also. <laughs> Could be. Those things are very close sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Erica Wangsgard asks, are there any simple educational board games slash um, medieval games geared towards young children or beginners like me? Uh, I can um, I can propose a game called Waterworks. It's a very simple game when uh, where you play by um, Lord of the Town, I think, and you... Uh, you need to develop a system of a pipes to, to water the whole, whole town. And uh, this game based on archaeological, uh, on archaeological uh, research in some way. So I think it's, uh, it's maybe not so simple because it's a card game, but I think uh, it's great. In, it's pixel art and uh, have a, a great uh, knowledge of medieval times. I think Carcassonne would be another good one along those lines. I'm taking notes. Um, and this one is for Al uh, Troll Holler, Troll Holler 2 coming out anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very <laughs> kind question. Yeah, um, Troll Holla, for the vast majority of people who don't know what that is, is um, it's based on a Muppet Show sketch, actually, of Viking pigs. Um, uh, that were looting and plundering, and I trained, changed them into trolls. And so it was the sequel to Bridge Trolls, so it would be the third in a trology. Trology, I didn't know that was the word. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to work on that. Yep, thank you. Um, and um, I, I particularly like this one, and I apologize that we're not gonna get through all of the questions. Some of them have been sort of covered in the discussion, but there's a lot of them. Uh, what's a little, factoid from your individual works that may be hard to find in game or too obscure for most people to understand, but you're still very proud of it. Uh, one very small thing, it's, it's a joy finding people online, um, discovering little things that you maybe didn't think people would discover. Uh, and one of them is in a lot of the art that we're referencing, you see these characters that are, um, you know, wearing their wool hats, but they have a spoon stuck in them. Uh, and it's just a curious thing because you don't see it a lot in, in modern society. And so it, you know, inspired us to research thinking like, okay, what's going on here? Is it because spoons are more valuable? Like they had their one and they didn't want to lose it. So you stick it in your hat. Um, but just spoon hat character became very iconic. We'd reference the spoon hat guy all the time. So we had to put one in the game. And uh, when we were having some critiques on the character design of that uh, person initially, you know, the game director was like, I don't think the spoon's big enough. I think the spoon is, I think the spoon could be more dramatic. We want people to notice the spoon. So we revised it and revised it a couple of times. Um, this character's name is Carl, but as the acts progress and you see Carl in, in different states um, as the time jumps happen, the spoon in his hat continues to get a little bit bigger in each act um, <laughs> to, to uh, as a nod to that request from our director, which I really personally enjoy. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> I think in my own games, uh, count the number of goats. There's a goat in pretty much every one of my games. <laughs> Just because? No, I, it began with Bridge Troll, which had the three billy goats gruff. Uh. And then Troll Hollow followed that, where you want to loot and plunder, but you do not want to get a goat on your boat because they're the ones who caused the trouble. Um, but then after that, they sort of made their way into almost every game after that. It happens. <laughs> uh, 
And Dora, did you have any Easter eggs in? Um... I, I think I I think we have um, a couple of Easter egg, uh, and uh, maybe it's I don't know if it's Easter egg in some way, <laughs> but uh, uh, Andrea's mother from Pentiment is uh, character yeah. in our game, so I think it's great uh, great cooperation in some way, but so also. Cool. Uh, all hands of characters uh, are hands uh, of our developers. <laughs> mm. For example, um, my hands uh, used by uh, used, uh, my hands are hands of uh, signed Hildegard, for example. Mm. And it's funny to to to, to see uh, <laughs> my my piece in 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 the game. And also, uh, we had a couple of jokes. Uh, we have one joke that we uh, we are uh, still uh, talking about, <laughs> and its joke uh, it's it is this joke is about skeleton with beer and with mop, uh, and uh, because we have uh, fun of this joke, we um, implemented some names uh, abstract names based on this uh, on this uh, joke. So I think people sometimes can can find uh, funny names for the beasts and characters in our game. I know I think we're starting to really come up against the time, but I want to end with one really broad question. Um, what makes a successful game? Successful on any level? What is it that you want the games to do? I, I think uh, most important thing is uh, probably some kind of luck because uh, you can may, make make a great game, but 10 years later, it will be some kind of success. So sometimes uh, luck is the best, uh, the most important thing for the success. With respect to games, um, board games, it reminds me of with books, it's been said that the good writing conveys something to the reader, but great writing conveys the reader. Um, you want to convey those playing a game. You want to transport them to somewhere they haven't been. And that doesn't necessarily equate to fun. The Last of Us is not necessarily fun to play, but it's engaging. You were enthralled. You were taken someplace you hadn't been before, and you forget yourself and your troubles and whatnot and enter into another world for a little while. And to me, that's what success is in a game. It's not in the mechanics so much as the dynamics of what happens to you when you play and that is mysterious and that has its own luck and that depends on the chemistry of who you're playing with mm -hmm. and all sorts of things and so um that's the sort of thing that comes to mind for me yeah i think similarly for me as a creator if you're looking to tell a story and choosing a format of media to do it the thing that makes games unique is that they are interactive um and so in that way, the things that I think are the most exciting about releasing a game into the world and seeing players play it is just when you see the different ways that players can resonate with the piece that you made. Um, and that's, if that happens with anyone at all, I think it's a success on some level, um, you know, according to who and for, from a sales perspective, that might be different, but from a creator's perspective, like the whole point is just to have someone experience what you made and go like, oh man, like I can relate to this or to me, I think this is interesting because of this, or this reminded me of my mom, or this is like, uh, they, they bring their own personal context to the story that you made. Um, and hearing those experiences from people or uh, you know, those, those shared passions and why they thought it was interesting is like the most exciting part of uh, the, the interaction between us as creators and the audience that plays the thing eventually to me. Well, I think that's kind of a beautiful place to stop. Um, it's such a privilege to hear from all of you. Your work is so wonderful. Thank you for joining us, for transporting us. Um, and I hope that we'll all go out and play the games which are spectacular. Yeah. Um, so I will wish everyone um, thank you and also go see Play in the Fast Times in the Middle Ages. Thank you, Noah. Thank you.